and welcome to our Sunday morning worship service as we gather to worship and glorify our Father in heaven. May all praise, honor, and glory be unto him in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. We hope you will be both enlightened and edified by today's lesson. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. We're glad to have you all with us this morning. Uh, if we have any visitors, we're we're very proud and thankful for you to being with us today. And if you would, there should be a card in front of you. If you'd fill that out, we'd love to have a record of your attendance. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to you. Do you be the glory in all things that we do for you are the great I am. Father, thank you for your love to us. Thank you for your mercy, and especially, Father, I thank you for your grace by sending Christ Jesus to us that we can have him in our lives. Father, we come this morning to praise your name and to glorify you. We do that in song that we praise you, and we glorify you in speaking the truth here this morning. Songs that remind us of a sacrifice, yet risen Savior for us all. For all that obey, Father, for the, we sing of a land far away. Friends that have gone on before us. We're thankful for the written word as we glorify you by speaking the truth in it. It can be a comfort to us in times of crisis. It can be a solace to us in times of sickness. And it can, uh, the word can uplift us when we're down. Thank you for the knowledge that we gain from the word that we can have greater wisdom, a better understanding of life. And from that, we're able to glow, grow closer to you. Thank you for your wisdom of the church, the most important thing in, on this earth, the church that Christ gave his life for. We realize, Father, that sin needed a Savior. And thank you for these people that have realized that same thing also that have assembled here this morning. People with the same mindset, the same agendas, the same goals a common bond of love that we have for one another. Father, help us to strive to do good in this world, to do good unto all people, and especially, of course, to the household of faith. Father, thank you for our elders that shepherd over us, for the deacons that do the work, for the preachers that preach the truth here, for Bible class teachers, and for those members that just help us keep strong in the faith. Father, thank you for parents of children as they teach them the purpose of the church and that they show them. Be with those that protect our freedom, Father, that sacrifice their lives, that are willing to put themselves in harm's way that we can have this name of freedom. Father, we pray for those that are sick. We pray for those that have had surgeries or upcoming surgeries. We pray for people that are misunderstood. We pray for people that may, they may turn, your, turn their heart to you. And Father, we ask that you be with those sick as their loved ones are awaiting their return, that they can come back and be with the family of Christ here also. Father, use us in your service each and every day. May we all, always be receptive to the work here whenever it's needed for us to be called on. We can say, send me. Let people see the reflection of Jesus Christ in our lives, the hope of glory. 
that as we travel in this world and as we see a lost and dying world, we can show them Jesus in us, our hope, our Redeemer, and our Savior, the epitome of protection, of perfection, whom our lives revolve around. Father, we realize that sometimes we let the world enter our lives, and we ask forgiveness of that. But we also ask, Father, that you, we, you use your providential care to take care of us, because sometimes in this world we have toils and troubles, and we ask that you watch over us. Father, be with us as we continue into this worship service. All things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And in this prayer, we ask that, and it's his, and it's his name. Amen. Number 468. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. The glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. My gracious Master and my God assists me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth above the honors of thy name jesus the name that charms our fear that bids our sorrow cease tis music in the sinner's ear tis life and health and peace he breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets a prisoner free. His blood can make the palace clean. His blood avails for me. Our next song is number 237. 200. 37. Deeper than the ocean and wider than the sea is the grace of the Savior for sinners like me. Sing from the Father and the grace. His grace reaches me and will last through eternity. Now I'm His control and I'm happy in my soul just to know Oh, 
His grace reaches me. Yes, His grace reaches me. He and will last through eternity. Now I'm under His control. Just to know that His grace reaches me. If you'd like to mark the hymn after the lesson this morning, it will be number four. And before Brother Lindell speaks to us, let's sing number 609. 690. There's a land beyond the river that they call the sweet forever. And we only reach that shore by face decree. One by one we'll reach the portals that we dwell with the immortals when they ring those golden bells for you and me won't you hear the bells are ringing don't you hear the angels singing is the glory Just beyond the shining river When they ring those golden bells For you and me We shall know no sin nor sorrow In that kingdom of tomorrow when our bark shall sail beyond the silver sea, we shall only know the blessing of our Father's sweet blessing. When they ring those golden bells for you and me, don't you hear the bells are ringing? Don't you hear the angels singing? Tis a glory, hallelujah, to believe in that far of sweet forever, just beyond the shining. When they ring those golden bells for you and me, when our days shall know their number, when in death we sweetly slumber, then the King commands the Spirit to be free. Never more with anguish laden, we shall reach that lovely heaven. When they ring those golden bells for you and me, don't you hear the bells are ringing? Don't
You may not know it, but you want to hear those bells. But I suspect most that are gathered here today know it quite well. Certainly good to see all of you today. Good to have the McDonald's back among us. Uh, and we are mindful of the loss that they've had. And yet we give great, great thanks for the long and productive and faithful life that Herschel's mother was able to enjoy and for what she's bequeathed to her children and grandchildren. I want us to read, I want to read this morning from Romans chapter 7. And what we're talking about is the need to clean up your own mess. Clean up your own life. Maybe your life's not a mess. Mine has, has been at times, at least I thought it was. And there's a need to do a cleanup. And Romans chapter 7, beginning here at verse 18, he says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me. Now, this is the Apostle Paul, I should say. Nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh, for the willing is present in me, but the doing of good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in my members, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other hand, my flesh, the law of sin. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life is in Christ Jesus and has set you free from the law of sin and of death. A powerful passage, a passage where Paul just gets right down to the, to the nubbin, if you will. And he's honest before his God with the battle that he has. And you know what? That's a battle we all have to fight. Everybody has to fight that. And the people that would deny that are telling a storybook story and won't admit it. A person's conscience, we think about that, Paul's conscience here working, it's an indispensable thing. And when it works as it should, it would never lead one astray. But this indispensable conscience is at the same time one of the most appalling scourges inflicted on the human family. And let me explain that a bit. One's conscience can attach itself to trivialities of human behavior, have great scruples about things that don't really matter. You know, the mint, anise, and cumin of conduct, those were table spices. The Pharisees were very careful to give a tenth of their table spices. But Jesus said, you, you neglect the way to your matters of the law. And until, uh, if we get into that rut, then it will almost drive a person insane by being scrupulous about things that are of no consequence. It doesn't matter one way or another. Conversely, the conscience may swing to the negative side of conduct and inhibit and repress somebody who might otherwise have been joyful and happy, and imprison that individual in negative conscientiousness. You know, we, we know that they struggled, for example, in Romans 14, with whether or not you could eat meat that had been offered to idols. Paul said, we all know there's nothing wrong with that meat, but if it's going to cause your brother to uh, stumble, it'd be better not to eat it. But there's nothing wrong with the meat. And I'm sure they eventually figured that out. Conscience can sanction sometimes absurd 
cruel customs. I study somewhat about the American Revolution, not a lot, but some, interested in it, and have had the opportunity to be in old Boston. And uh, the, the Quakers and uh, Puritans and, and some of those people were, of course, in that area. And they had what I consider quirky uh, customs that they sanctioned. There's a story told of a Captain Kimball. He came home from a long sea voyage, and sometimes those voyages were years, three or four years in, in, uh, in the making, you know, of it. But they put him in public stocks, and you know what his crime was? That rascal kissed his wife on his steps going into the house on Sunday. Now, that's first opinions, see, it's where you find that. There ain't anything. I, I, all I have to be away from the house is a week, and I want to kiss my wife, you know, and I just hope she'll kiss me back. Now, that, that's a custom. It makes no sense. But conscience can do that. Conscience can make us so hypersensitive sometimes that we would prefer the company of a, of a kindly sinner. And so we don't want to let it get out of hand, but we do want to have a clean, wholesome, holy life before the Lord. And regardless of how well uh, we attempt to do, most of us are faced sometimes with an accusing conscience. And one of the things that it will tell you typically is you ought not to be what you are. Paul's experience presented in the scriptures is an example. And that in Romans is an example. The religion that he accepted met his human need with a saving message. Surely you're not what you ought to be, but you don't have to stay that way. That was the message Paul got. The gospel of Christ, as we think about it, is an extension of his personal ministry. And when Jesus walked the earth, he found a lot of unpromising people. I took a, a personal evangelism course one time, and it was pretty good, but they were talking about prospecting. You've got limited time, so you want to uh, use your time wisely. So, you know, you, you prospect out there for the really good, promising people. Well, Jesus found, I mean, he went looking for unpromising people. Uh, the woman of Samaria. The prodigal son. Crooked public servants, Zacchaeus, comes to mind. Fishermen, Peter, Andrew, and James and John. But when he left them, they were so changed that you wouldn't hardly recognize them. Jesus always took it for granted that changes, even dramatic changes, are an, uh, an essential element of the human life so instead of being an oddity, they're, they're expected. You come into the kingdom, there's change that takes place, or should. Nowhere in human relationships is attitude toward people more strikingly different from ours than here. We often size folks up, look them over, take their measure, form our estimate, and then politely leave them alone. Lord, <laughs> he didn't do that. When Jesus saw a person, he not only sized him up, he saw what he could be or she could be. He saw what the possibilities were. Now, we can't, I don't have the insight the Lord did. I'll tell you what you can do, though. You can act as if until you know otherwise in dealing with people. I remember Herschel talking about dealing with inmates. He said one of the Warden's called him in and said, you, you just don't have any discipline problems. What, what is it? And he said, well, I was always taught if you treat a man like a man, he's apt to act like a man. That's, that's pretty good policy. Till you make me do otherwise or make me conclude otherwise, I'm going to come at you as somebody of worth and value and what have you. That's what Jesus did. And that's what the gospel proposes to do to make change, positive change. It finds a man uh, that is not what he ought to be and plainly tells him that. We have an element 
among our brethren that are just so scared. I guess they're scared of the shadow, you know, and they won't even uh, declare where a person is so that they will be motivated to make a positive change. One of my professors at Fred Hardman was out studying with the guy. He said, been going over there every night for three weeks trying to get this man to see. And said, he looked like that. And said, Brad, you think I'm lost, don't you? And said, of course I think you're lost. Why do you think I've been in Coleman over here every night? And uh, he, he got him to go ahead and obey the gospel. Uh, but said, yeah. And he told him that, not because he's mad at him, but because he wanted to help him be better. And so when the gospel plainly tells a person that they have a problem, it doesn't leave them there. It shows him what he's capable of doing. Look at John chapter 16, and uh, verse 5 through 13. But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you ask, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. And if I go... I will send him to you. And he said, when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Because they do not believe in me. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. And con concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. I have many other things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will speak and will disclose to you what is to come. And so uh, he, he had great confidence in these men because he's going to enable them to share that gospel to help people make these changes. The world as such doesn't know anything about sin. And yet sin is the root of all mankind's problems. Rebellion against God is the root of all of it. And it is the purpose of the gospel, the Spirit's message, to convict. That is, to convince people of the world that they are guilty of rebellion against God. The gospel does not leave them there, however. The gospel shows them how to become righteous. Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 1 and 18, Come now. And let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. He didn't leave him there, did he? He didn't leave him there. He said, you, you, oh my, you have a sin problem. But we're going to correct it is what's implied. Hebrews 10, 17, in their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. That's where he wants to go. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. The text says it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. Yet for this reason I found mercy so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Every, every one of these passages, we're going to, take them from where they are to eternal life. We're going to change the position because we're going to change the man's heart. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 9 and 10, Brother Paul's again writing, and he says, For I am the least of the apostles, and not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me did, uh, did, prove, did not prove vain. But I labored even more than them all, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. And so it wasn't a wasted effort. He couldn't see himself the way Jesus saw him. Jesus knew what he could be when he confronted him after on the road to Damascus. You know, wild-eyed Pharisee, he's going around persecuting the church. That had to be, it's hard for me to grasp in my mind what that had to have been like. When the Lord appeared and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I, I just, my, my, my. And Paul never allowed himself to become an arrogant man at all. But he said that that investment the Lord made in him 
It wasn't wasted. Well, how did the Lord go about changing people? When Jesus sought to change a man, he didn't ever leave the impression on him or a woman uh, that he was trying to import something that was fake and phony from the outside, something that's artificial and alien, and, and, you know, and infuse that into him. He never did that. Instead, he made the person know that he saw something in him which he himself was unaware of, and that he's going to make manifest, that he's going to bring it out. The Lord is. John 1, 42, he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You're Simon, son of John. You shall be known as Cephas. Changed his name. He knew where he was going to go with Peter. As the story goes, John Whitcomb Riley was a miserable failure in his early schooling. Uh, he was a famous author. One of his classmates said he was the most celebrated in failure and arithmetic in the county. Wasn't a mathematician. But later he came under the influence of another teacher who recognized uh, Riley's propensity for literary accomplishments. And he encouraged that, or she did. I don't know if it was a man or a woman. And the attitude and the approach of the two teachers made a difference between success and failure so far as Riley was concerned. Uh, the one tried to bring something from the outside and plug that in. The other began with the boy and directed him so that he could develop what was already in him. Now, anybody can learn to write reasonably well, but there are not very many natural writers. But Talley's one. He doesn't believe it, but he is. Uh, and I know some others that are just, when they write something, man, it clicks. And that's a great gift. And that's what the teacher was looking for in Riley. What was it that he had and encouraged him? Well, that enabled him to realize his dreams. So it is with the gospel. It, it first works to persuade a man or a woman to see themselves as they really are, a sinner in need of salvation, not somebody that's pompous and arrogant and somebody that can't be corrected and won't, you know, didn't want to hear it, not like that at all, not that spirit at all, but somebody that's in trouble and needs help, and he's here to help. And it's, so it takes him and it directs him in a manner to cause him to want to become capable of becoming a child of God a person free from sin, suited for a habitation with the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, Brother Paul is writing to some folks at Corinth, come out of a tough background. But notice what he says to them. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. So he's, he's taking them to a different place because I'm telling you, that's not... If you wanted to insult a man's wife or daughter, you just call her a cute little Corinthian back in the first century. And, and of course, I'd probably get you in a scrap because that, that was a rough bunch of folks. But he says now to people that have come out of that, recognize where they were, now we need you to go on. Each man must clean up his own life. And that's the thing sometimes, you know, I can't clean your life. You can't clean mine. Uh, we have personal, there's a thing called personal responsibility that is fast vanishing from the American scene, but not from among God's people. Everybody has his own burden to carry. Christianity is preeminently a religion addressed to individuals. Someone has said that Christ Whenever he met anyone, it was as though he regarded that person like an island around which he would sail until he found out what the real problem was and he'd land right there and would deal with it. For example, when a rich young ruler came to him, what did they go to? They went to a discussion about money. Why? Because that young man had a problem. The woman of Samaria. Where'd I go? Where'd, he, where, where'd the Lord take that discussion? To her family affairs. What about Zacchaeus? Well, there, there's a couple of concepts called justice and honesty that we need to talk about Zacchaeus. 
He went right to it. And there was a realism in the approach of Jesus and getting at the genuine problem of anybody he touched, which made him a terror, I mean an absolute terror, to anyone who did not want to be brought face to face with himself. Uh, being face to face with self is disconcerting for some of us, perhaps most of us, because there's not one of us that's without sin, without need for help. And if this penetrating personal dealing, if that is not the central business of the Christian religion, then I, I want to know what it is. What is the central business? So that you got to go there. You got to go face to face with self. You got to let him take you there and then respond to him according to his will. We habitually resent and resist that for a couple of reasons. It's, it's hard. For one thing, that's not one of the reasons. First reason is that we don't want to be brought face to face with self because we know what's in there. John 3, verse 19, beginning, says, This is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. There it is. For everyone who does evil hates the light, and he does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. And they will. They already have been. God's aware of it. But he who practices the truth comes to the light, so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. The second reason, we object to the penetrating personal dealing involved in the Christian religion. If you're going to practice New Testament Christianity, you're going to have to face self. You're going to have to clean up at your own house. And that's true for every one of us. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, he says, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division and the, the, uh, of the soul and the spirit of both joints and marrow and is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. We find it easier to center attention on the social application of Christianity, the societal problem. Uh, many today are persuading themselves to think our problems are primarily social rather than individual spiritual matter. Uh, in this, we should consider man's first responsibility is to himself. Romans chapter 14, verse 4 and verse 12, respectively. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand for the Lord, who is able to make him stand. Verse 12, so then each one of us will give an account of who? Himself to God. We're his servant. And that view implies a, he a healthy sense of self. Uh, rather than an unhealthy, exaggerated altruism where we're going to save the world and deal with everybody's problem but my own. So people can get into that. And I don't doubt necessarily their sincerity, but they got their own problems to deal with. And that's where they need to go. He may think, this individual that is dealing with everything in society, he may think he's generously caring for the world when in reality he's using his care for the world as a large es a escape from the far more exacting task of taking charge of himself. In John chapter 4, Turn over there with me, John chapter 4. We just read the Bible, son. John chapter 4. And we'll take a reading from, from uh, what Brother John has to say. Verse 15, beginning. 
The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water. He's the woman by the well, and he's talking about giving her living water so that you never thirst again. Give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come all this way to draw. He said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have correctly said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one with whom uh, you are now is not your husband. This you have truly said. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people, talking about Jews, say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, Believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for such people the Father seeks to be his worshiper. God is the Spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He is the one who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And so, now watch what happens. She couldn't escape personal responsibility. Do you see what she did? He starts dealing with her marital problem. And then she starts talking about whether or not the Samaritans or the Jews are right to worship at Gerizim or uh, the Mount Zion. And uh, he answers it. He says, we're right on that one, but the time is coming when that's not going to be a big problem anymore. When either the New Testament or the Old Testament proclaims an, an altruism, look that up, uh, it always couples it with a, a healthy self-respect. In Matthew 22, verse 39, the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Thus one is to look after himself, and when that is done, then he's come to the place he can, he can begin. And he has a standard of judgment uh, regarding his attitude and his approach to others. In 1 Timothy 4 and verse 16, Paul tells Timothy, pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. And in Acts 20, at verse 28, be on your guard for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So there is no social sin whose central responsibility is not inside the person. It's not society. It's me and people like me. It should be kept in mind that society is not some sort of an organism. It doesn't have a personality, and its show doesn't have any sense. I know I said show. I just like to say that. Uh, it doesn't have any judgment. It's just that kind of a thing. Uh, it, it's an abstract. And so uh, it can't be moral or immoral apart from the individuals that compose the society. And at all the good and all the bad that uh, may characterize it are first in individuals and only secondarily in relationships. Romans chapter 15, verse 1, beginning. Now we who are strong ought to bear witness of those without strength and not to please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to his edification. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. In, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, verse 33, he says, Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, so that they may be saved, be ye imitators of me, as I also am of Christ, Paul's writing. So what are, uh, ju just what are social sins? A social sin is something like war. That's a social problem. But it's the result of a bunch of individuals getting together 
taking up arms and killing the guys that are on the other side of the field. Economic evils are social sins. Uh, but these are the result of the way multitudes of individuals think and act and interact with other people. This does not mean if every individual were of good character that all those problems would go away because a, uh, a society is kind of like a brick building. You, you can have all good bricks, but the bricks got to be lined up right. They got to be put together in a way that will be sound if you want that. And it, it, that takes some administrative work. Uh, individuals must remember that social problems adhere in individuals and the kind of conduct that they, that they bring to it. And this is especially true of the church. No social order will ever come, brethren, that relieves individual uh, Christians of the responsibility of cleaning up their own life. There's no social order that's going to do that. There's no organized effort that's going to do that. I'm not opposed to organizing to try to help people in any way that we can, but I'm just saying it's got to be on an individual basis. In no instance does the Bible ever require the society to reform. What do you mean? I mean, that's what I said. The responsibility for action is on individuals. He requires individuals to do better. Uh, one of the inescapable determinants of a man's destiny is to meet himself in varied experiences of life. So many are cynical about the world. They declare, well, how does anyone expect somebody to behave themselves in a world like this? Well, that's, you know, one of the best evidences of faulty thinking is a mind that uh, when you record what it finds fault with and expresses. Because a lot of times the individual is communicating more about self than they are in, in anybody else, particularly the whole society. That's the kind of person he is. And he is telegraphing what he's letting the world do to him because he is that kind of person. And so we want to think about that. Some seem to think that it would be much easier for them to do right if we had a better social order, if we had a friendlier spirit, if we had a better cooperation, if that was evident. But really, uh, would such a society automatically run itself? You know, it would be marvelous to have that kind of society, but it, would, it takes great personnel. It takes character on the part of multitudes of individuals, devoted people, unselfish people, disciplined people, people free from prejudice to sustain a world like that. The better the social order we achieve, the finer the personal character it will take to sustain it, to administer it. At Romans chapter 12 and verse 10, he said, Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and 15, he said, See that no one repays another evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another for, and for all people. That's a different kind of world, and it's got different kind of individuals. A commonly heard assertion is if circumstances were changed, people would change. That's a lot of the social programs that the government has, I guess, are well-meaning. As far as I know, they're well-meaning, but a lot of those programs operate on that premise. If you change the circumstances, everything's going to be all right. Well, that's only half true. Turn the statement around and look at it from the other side. If people change, the circumstances would change. People in their hearts change. They'd have a different kind of society. And that's perhaps the world's greatest need. It would be wonderful if everybody present made the determination right now that from henceforth, I am going to take a close, unflinching look at self, and I'm going to resolve that with God's help, I'm going to clean up anything that needs cleaning. And a few things will uh, assist us in, in doing that, and the less will be yours. Don't let nobody allege that they haven't sinned. 1 John chapter 1. If we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If you go on down through, read that through verse 10, he says, you know, if you say that, you're making him a liar. Thus he says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another 
because the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, James 5 and verse 16. Recognize that even persecutors can think they're right. Uh, you remember Brother Paul. He thought he was right. And he couldn't have been more wrong persecuting God's church. The divine criterion is this, Matthew 7 and verse 20. So then, you will know them by their fruits. What fruit is being produced in your life today? If it's not good fruit, you need to confront that. And then you need to come, you need to, come to Christ making that, conf that confrontation and consent to allow Him to be in charge henceforth and forever. And if you believe that Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God, the Son of God requires that one would repent and turn away from sin, take a different path. I tell you, neighbor, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And then He says, confess me. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I also confess before my Father who is in heaven. Next verse, he says, if you deny me, I'll deny you. Don't deny the Lord. And don't allow anybody, to, don't allow the devil to scare you or anybody to intimidate you about making a response if you need to. And then consent to be buried with him in baptism for the remission of sins and rise up to walk in that new life. We would love to help you do that. As together we're standing and singing. Someday you'll stand at the bar and you'll find Someday your record you'll see Someday you'll answer the question of life What will your answer be? What will it be? What will it be? Where will you spend your eternity? What will it be? Oh, what will it be? What will your answer be? Sadly, you'll stand if you're unprepared. Friendly, you'll fall on your knees. Facing the sentence of life or of death. What will that sentence be? What will it be? What will it be? Where will you spend your eternity? What will it be? Oh, what will it be? What will your answer be? Now is the time to prepare. Make your soul spotless and free. Wash in the blood of the crucified one. He will your answer be. What will it be? What will it be? Where will you spend your eternity? What will it be? Oh, what will it be? What will your answer be? Be seated, please. Before we partake the Lord's Supper, let's sing number 12. Alas, and did my Savior leave, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Was it for crimes that I have done? He Ground up on the tree, amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. Well, might the sun in darkness hide and 
We come to that part of the worship service where we will take of the Lord's Supper. The Lord instituted the Lord's Supper and gave us these emblems that represent His body and His blood. Let's think on these things as we prepare to partake. Our God and Father in heaven, we come before you at this time thanking you for every blessing that you give us. Thankful, Father, for your Son who came to this earth and suffered and died on the cross for our sins. Father, we pray that you'd be with us as we partake of this bread, which represents Christ's body. We pray, Father, that you would help us to examine ourselves and partake in a worthy manner. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please bow again as we offer thanks for the fruit of the vine. Father, we come before thee once more, thanking you for Christ and for the blood that he shed on the cross that we might have forgiveness of sin. We ask your blessings upon this fruit of the vine, which represents the blood that he shed. And we pray, Father, that you would be with us and help us to remember that sacrifice and pray, Father, that we will partake in a worthy manner. In Christ's name, amen. We have another act of worship, that of giving. As many of you know, we have a box in the foyer where you can put your contribution as you come, come in or as you leave. And at this time, we want to ask the Lord's blessings upon that contribution. Father, we come at this time mindful of the many temporal blessings that you give us. Thankful, Father, for the health that you give us that permits us to earn a portion of this world's good. We pray, Father, that you be with us as we purpose in our heart 
what we would like to return to you. We pray, Father, that we, we would give in a cheerful manner in a way in which we've been prospered. We pray, Father, that these funds will be used to spread your word throughout the world. All these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. I think probably most of us know today's Memorial Day. And I wanted to read something in thanks to veterans, particularly those that have paid the ultimate price, but to all our veterans. It is the veteran, not the preacher, who's given us freedom of religion. It is the veteran, not the reporter, who's given us the freedom of press. It is the brethren, not uh, the veteran, rather, not the poet, who's given us freedom of speech. It is the veteran, not the campus organizer, who has given us freedom to assemble. And it is the veteran, not the lawyer, who's given us the right to a fair trial. And it is the veteran, not the politician, who's given us the right to vote. Now, that is exactly as it is. And there are many veterans that are spread around the world, some of them, many of them in military cemeteries. You go to France, and there are thousands of white crosses and stars of David. Uh, Baguio, near Baguio City in the Philippines are just a number of places where our people have bled and died a number of times for somebody else's freedom or to relieve someone else's problem. I don't know of any other great empire that's done that. I'm not saying the old empire is perfect, but I'm thankful to be part of a people uh, that would sacrifice for others. And I think we should be thankful. And if you ever get a chance, I go to see the Vietnam Memorial, as well as the rest of them in Washington, D.C. Shall we be standing for dismiss? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all you give us. We pray that we use it to glorify you. We pray that we worship you in a manner pleasing unto you. We ask that you be with all those that are ill, both the ones that were mentioned and the ones that are on the list in the bulletin that is growing daily. We pray that you'll bless them, be with them, be with those that have lost loved ones, comfort them, and be with them. We ask that you be with us and help us to let our light shine for you through us. We want to thank you most for your grace and love. In Jesus' name, amen.